This podcast episode contains a discussion about sexual assault, which may be triggering to some listeners. Discretion is advised. You're tuning in to Lovecraft Country Radio. There's some strong language and spoilers ahead. Buckle up. I don't know what is more difficult, being colored or being a woman. Most days I'm happy to be both, but the world keeps interrupting and I am sick of being interrupted. Shannon, I too am sick of being interrupted. You know what? I don't know if I'm as sick as Ruby is at the end of this episode, but (laughs) I'm also pretty fucking sick. None of us, not one of us is as sick as Ruby is at the end of this episode. So let's get into it. Episode five, Strange Case. Welcome to Lovecraft Country Radio. I'm Ashley C. Ford, podcast host, writer, and horror enthusiast. And I'm Shannon Houston, a writer for the HBO series Lovecraft Country and mother to three free Black children. Amen. In case you forgot, somehow, the absurdities of this episode. I I don't know how you could have. (laughs) Ruby turns into a white woman. Mm -hmm. Montrose leans into his sexuality in a major way. And Tick's anger almost drives a wedge between him and Letty's relationship. Shannon, this episode is a lot. It is. It is. And I I weirdly feel like I need to apologize to you and the entire audience (laughs) just for putting you through this hour. But it had to be done. Um, It's a big episode. If you feel some type of way right now, let me tell you, the writer's room was on fucking fire every time we discussed this episode's main storyline. I personally started the room really hating the idea of a Black woman choosing to be white. And I had so many feelings, and I wasn't alone in those feelings. And since we started working on the show a couple of years ago, I've really changed my tune about Ruby. I love this story. But it's also a lot to unpack, Ashley. Oh, yes, it is. I know that. (laughs) And to help us unpack some of this episode, we're going to be joined by Eric Eddings, podcast extraordinaire and co-host of The Nod Show. And for Colored Nerds, both amazing shows. But before Eric comes on, Shannon, let's get into some of the major moments in this episode. (laughs) There's so many. Um, What really stood out for me in this episode is this idea of monstrosity Mm. and the way these characters are navigating not just the external monsters, but the internal ones as well. You know, what we see in this episode is that sometimes our heroes, our favorite characters, can actually be monsters and they can make Mm. some really questionable decisions. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited about it because in so many shows or movies, The Black characters can be handled very delicately. They're either all-knowing or they're unnaturally moral to the point of being, like, (laughs) not real, like, not human. And what I love about our show is these are flawed, fucked up, beautiful, strange human characters. And sometimes those flaws are deeply complex and also deeply monstrous. I really want to talk about who the monsters are we are okay with and who are the ones we don't really want to call a monster. I think about this a lot in my writing and in just my life because I think one of the largest lessons of my life so far has been that nobody can be summed up by the best or worst thing they've ever done, but you should know what the best thing you've ever done and the worst thing you ever done are and the best thing you should celebrate and the worst thing should probably be making amends. So I think the most obvious character to start with is Atticus, who for all intents and purposes is the hero of this story. But Atticus has got a lot of shit to unpack. He sometimes handles that unpacking in really toxic ways. And it's really hard for me to be perfectly honest, not to want to go upside his head a little bit, not to want to like address him. 
You know, there are times when he says things on the show that I'm like, I wish that I could pause and call Jonathan Majors and be like, I just need to say something to you really quickly. Um, and then you can go back about your life. But this is a moment for me. And it just, it needs to go down this way. I don't have that kind of access, but boy, oh boy, do I wish I did. In that scene where Atticus is beating the crap out of his father in front of Letty, and two grown men have to pull him off of his dad, what was your reaction to that? And what did you think of Atticus in that moment? That's a hard moment for me, you know, because I was feeling Atticus and also judging Atticus and also in turns judging myself, right? Because when you grow up with a violent parent, I think it is really normal to have fantasies about violent retribution Mm. against your parent. And so much of this show is about a playing out of some of the darkest fantasies we have. And this was a core fantasy. And the shame is going to be core, I think, for Atticus as well, for having taken that moment and doing the thing that he's been wanting to do for so long. It just messed me up because I just, so many of those emotions were familiar, like, the guilt and the anger and the shame and the guilt and the anger and the shame and that spiral. Ooh, ooh. I am screaming internally. I'm not going to scream into the mic, but I'm screaming (laughs) internally because I just am like, have we ever as a community sat down and discussed that phenomena? No, I've never been a part of that discussion. I don't want to have the discussion now. Part of what I want to do is say, let's move on. Let's get back to the show. Let's get back to Ruby. But it's like, Shit, that's real. Atticus. Oh, yeah. Feeling the release. Like, that's why he can't stop himself, right? Like, yes. He's been abused by this man since he was a child. And this man has just murdered a person. Yes. In an attempt to control Atticus, right? Like, we've talked about this before. Are we keeping secrets from our children to help them? Really? Mm. Or is it just shit we don't want to talk about? Are we hitting our children to help them? Really? Or are we just really angry that day and it feels kind of good? Right. And what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that say about you? And the thing is, you know, I think some people could accept that I don't want to be the kind of person who uh, disciplines or reacts in anger with like physical violence. But in order to like really accept that, you then have to accept that like, wait, maybe my mom shouldn't have done that to me. And maybe her dad shouldn't have done that to her. And since, like, so much of the community idea, um, and not in all Black communities, not for all Black people, but I would definitely say where I grew up, the idea is that to tell the truth about how you really feel about being hit is a betrayal. To tell the truth about how you really feel about being punished in that moment. Like we might look back on it in time and go, well, you know, I was a pretty, I was, you know, a rougher kid than I thought I was. And it's like, yeah, but you were still not an adult. Even if you can look back with the eyes of an adult and see how you were being uh, annoying or how you were misbehaving or whatever in that moment or how frustrating it must have been for your parent, um, you were still not an adult then you were still a child and there was no way for you to have this future knowledge. And that's this thing, right? That like, uh, I'm trying to figure out the right way to say this because I don't want to offend people, but I also want to tell the truth. Say it. We have to be able to be honest and disobedient in order to be good parents. Because everything your parents did to and for you was not exactly right. And if you abandon that knowing so that you don't have to deal with or reckon with the relationship, then you are abandoning your children emotionally in certain places where you see their need And instead of meeting it, you're deciding that they shouldn't have it in the first place. 
And I think there's something happening here with Montrose in that way. I think he looks at Tick's need for connection and answers and freedom. And instead of trying to help him meet that need, he shames him for needing it in the first place because he already knows how much it hurts to need it and not get it. Yes. And if you think for a second that those choices that you're making as a parent aren't going to affect several future generations, aren't going to affect every relationship that your child has, and this is what's terrifying about being a parent. And it's like, Montrose, this is what's happening. Your anger is now a part of Letty and Atticus's relationship and their love affair and their romance and their ability to trust each other. Look, he probably thought he was he was protecting me by destroying everybody's access to more magic. Oh, no, 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 no. Is, is this? This is evil. It's the devil's tools. It is corrupting no, no, all Letty, of us. Letty, it's not. Look, it, it, no. it's not inherently evil, all right? It's what we do with it that matters. What we want to do, protect ours. How can that be bad? Look at what your father did to protect you. It has su- such like crazy effects. And I think that's one of the reasons that we do want to talk about anger right now, because we're also just thinking about like how these things, especially, you know, Black male anger, if we can call it that, but how much that has an effect and real consequences on Black women, which obviously we're seeing all of the time. And so there's a shift here with Letty and Atticus's relationship, and I'm I'm really excited to see how people respond. But she's scared in this scene, and mm-hmm. it made um made me think of that Nikki Giovanni James Baldwin conversation that always yes. makes its way around every once in a while. And there's this quote: "Because I love you, I get the worst of you. Mm-hmm. Lie to me, fake it with me, like you do with the white man. Like there's a resistance, I think." within relationships to acknowledge how much white supremacy and the white gaze is literally just impacting a love affair, right? Like how much it's in the room with Letty and Atticus and that baseball bat. And there's also this issue too that I'm, it's like I'm nervous to talk about it because I worked on the show. And, but I'm also, I'm ready to sit here and reckon with the fact that As a community, we too frequently mistake intensity for intimacy. And a lot of times that Mm. intensity has tinges of violence. And I'm scared to ask the question, but I will ask the question. Are we romanticizing the angry Black man by making Atticus our hero? In this episode, uh, we have my absolute, like, favorite sex scene, (laughs) like, ever, (laughs) potentially. (laughs) Letty and Atticus on the car. Oh, yeah. Uh, Letty and Atticus on the couch. Oh, yeah. It's hot and it's beautiful. And and he says that line that you love. What's the line? Um, he says, please don't be scared of me. Please don't be scared of me. Thank you. For stopping me. If I wasn't there, would you have killed him? I've imagined it enough when I was younger. Mostly after he beat me. Seeing that side of you scares me. Please don't be scared of me. So much of I feel like when we're talking about this anger, right? I think so often about my childhood um, is that the issue was not that the anger existed. It's that the anger existed and then we couldn't talk about what happened in the anger. Mm it was supposed to disappear. Mm -hmm. Nobody had to say sorry or change. It just happened and then it was supposed to be gone. But it wasn't gone. It was still in the air. It was everywhere and all around us, right? And I felt so often like all I wanted in that moment was for somebody to say, oh my gosh, I see that you're scared and that wasn't my intention. I wasn't trying to scare you. I understand that my anger can be scary, 
But I want to say to you right now that there is nothing to be afraid of and that I have no intention of hurting you. And how that might have just cut the tension enough right. in the moment to be able to like process those feelings a little bit better and not like stuff them down. Yes. And his reaching out, as we talk about like this idea of generational passing on of anger and things like that, his reaching out is already such progress from what he came mm-hmm. up in. Mm-hmm. And that was him making a move toward it and trying to heal it. I mean, I know they ended up boning and that didn't necessarily have to be the end game in that moment, but <laughs> it was a pretty good TV end game and a sexy one at that. So Atticus's anger is obviously rooted, I mean, possibly even created by his relationship with his father, Montrose, uh, who, as we all know at this point, has had his own journey with monstrous acts. Well, Montrose is really the problem child of this show. We can say that (laughs) right up front. He's filled with so many secrets and anger. And, you know, I, I think it's best in the name of nuance that we talk about him with someone who can maybe better address an angry Black man. Uh, How about a Black man? Hey, how about it? I think it's time for Eric Eddings to join us in this conversation. I heard you guys needed a Black man. (laughs) (laughs) I know one. And a Black man arrived. How you doing, (laughs) bud? Welcome, Black I'm man. I'm doing well. I, I'm stressed by this episode, but but in a good way. So I'm excited <laughs> to, to sit in. There's a lot to be stressed about, right? Yes, there is. absolutely. I cannot blame you even a little bit for being stressed about this episode because I was definitely stressed about this episode. So first, what are we learning about Montrose in this episode. Is any of it shocking to you, Eric? Well, I think the interesting thing is we've seen we've seen seeds for who Montrose really is throughout mm. the other episodes. But I think uh, the thing that was pretty amazing about this episode is, is here's where it kind of comes into focus. You know, we've known that Montrose was uh, hiding. We've known that, we hiding something. We've known that he was kind of shutting the people around him out. Obviously, we've seen his struggles with addiction and alcoholism, but we haven't really had a clear idea why. Uh, to date, it seems kind of rooted in this idea that he wanted to protect them. But he also wants distance. Mm. He also wants distance yes. because he he can't, fully reconcile who he truly is and whether or not he can be who he wants to be to his family. Mm. Uh, And so he acts out. And, you know, the sad thing about that is that is a very familiar formula. It doesn't often involve magic and, uh, (laughs) you know, and kind of some of the, some of the things that they've explored on the show, but that's not that surprising. There, there are a, a lot of black men you know, who for many different reasons have experienced trauma and they use that trauma to push out all those around them. So mm. I think like what we see here uh, is the why. And it's it's also sad because I think who Montrose really is, 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 is really beautiful. We get to see him experience some, you know, some joy and some happiness. Uh, and you think about, man, what would his life be like if he could share even a piece of that, you know, with Tick? And and mm. it's like it, it yeah it's tough it it hurt it hurt literally yeah. watch him experience that pain. It's so funny hearing you like des- describe how beautiful his story could be. It made me think about um, in episode two when George is on the bed, and I think that's part of what we're seeing in this episode. Like literally a long time ago, somebody beat that out of Montrose yeah. and. That all this anger and rage has has grown in its place. But when Ashley and I have talked about this episode without a black man present, we were <laughs> like, fuck that. Yeah. Fuck that. Fuck you. And I said to Ashley, like, a lot of my anger is also coming off of literally just like thinking about Megan the Stallion and Tory Lanez yeah. and being like, well, yeah, we get it. We get that that a lot has happened to Black men in this country. And then there's a lot happening to Black women in this country as a result. But I think one question we're really grappling with and that this episode is grappling with is how do we hold 
Black men accountable for their actions while also telling their stories and also protecting them. It's really hard and complicated. Yeah. In watching Montrose's story, and this isn't a show that gives easy answers at all, but <laughs> do you have any answers to that question? Well, I mean, I think he he needs to be called out. He's done he's done some pretty horrible things. Mm-hmm. You know, like he he deserves retribution and other people deserve justice. Uh, and I think that's that's really hard. It's I mean, to the to your point earlier, yeah, fuck Montrose. Like he, he has done some really terrible shit. And sure, it's it's because he's experienced this trauma, uh, but that doesn't disregard that. It's it's kind of like he's leaned into patriarchy in kind of like all the worst ways as a way to protect himself. And if you don't end that cycle, it just continues. Mm. I'm still thinking about Yahima. You mm-hmm. know, that was one of those moments where you're just like. I don't know how you forgive that. And you see Letty struggling with receiving the the truth in that what Mm -hmm. Montrose has done, like you said, this this monstrous act, this horrific act, you know, protecting them isn't enough to justify harming someone else, and especially a character like Yahima. And so, yeah, I'm curious to see within the narrative, like what happens next? Uh, does, Does Yahima get justice? Does... You know, does Montrose have to reckon with the choices that he's made uh, mm-hmm. and the cycle that he's continuing? Um, it's it's going to be interesting. And, it, and it's hard because at the same time, I want him, I want justice for Yahima. But, mm-hmm. you know, I, I also, you know, I also was happy to see him experience some love. Yes. Uh, and, you know, and that's mm-hmm. hard because we... I, look, I have complicated relationships with many an old black man in my life, you know, <laughs> and, you know, and it's hard because you remember the things that you've experienced at their hand, quote unquote, um, but you also have empathy for who they are as a person, at least mm. me personally. And, you know, it's it, it's tough to hold those th- two things together. Uh, but for me, I think that's actually how the cycle changes. Ooh. You got to hold them accountable, but you also got to have, you know, a bit of empathy in there as well. It's interesting. I love the ballroom scenes. I love the scenes with Sammy. And now that I'm watching it again, I'm like, I know that he's escaping a little bit. Mm. And we talked in the writer's room about how part of part of what's happening in episode five is that coming off of episode four, Montrose knows or I should say Montrose feels Mm. Atticus is never going to talk to me again. That relationship is done. I ruined it. Um, I made a choice and I'm going to suffer the consequences. That's why he takes the beating in four and he doesn't fight him back. His brother is dead. And so I think he's kind of just like, fuck it all. And in a strange, sad way, the idea is that it frees him up Mm. to like finally actually be intimate in a real way with Sammy, to finally step into this world that he's been afraid to step into. Um, and there is beauty there, but it's it's also messy because there's I do think there's a little bit of escapism Absolutely. there as well, which, you know, not to take away from the fact that I think one of the things the episode is also saying is that the queer ballroom scene saves lives, mm. period. Yeah. Um, this is... This there is something real, there's something spiritual happening to Montrose in that scene. But I think what you're saying is true too. It's not enough. There's more work to do for 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 you to make it right. And not that you can ever make it right, but there's just more work for you to do. Sure. You know, I think that's that's how you stop yourself from being consumed by it. You have to chase your own joy and try to find a way to uh to profess it in this way, to be to be whole, to be seen, to be to be who you are. Um, to avoid, you know, that, again, that bitterness uh, from from kind of corrupting you. Eric, thank you so much for your time on the show today. We really appreciate thank it. You. This was, thank you. Thank you, Eric. It's really fun. We, we kept it light. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of anger, we obviously have to talk about anger and rage in the context of a Black woman, which is something that we don't get to see too often on screen. So I'm really excited that in addition to having some angry Black men, we have one very angry Black woman at the end of this episode. Let's discuss Ruby. Oh, yeah. You mean like the fact that she turns into a white woman? (laughs) A white woman? Say it with the H. Yeah. I love that. The white woman. (laughs) 
Yeah. Yeah, we got something to talk about. I want to talk about that. <sighs> several things. Several things to discuss. Several things to say. You scared the shit out of me to wake up white. And when I was stumbling down the street, crazed and disheveled and screaming at everybody around me, they weren't scared of me. They were scared for me. They all treated me like... A human being. So I think that it's important to think about this episode in terms of passing, right? And there's a lot of passing going on. On the one hand, yes, Ruby is turning into a white woman, but it's also passing. Ruby is passing for a white woman. I think Montrose is also passing to a degree in his life as a straight man. And then, of course, we have this batshit crazy reveal at the end, which is that Christina is somebody who's been taking the potion as well. And therefore, Christina is a white woman oftentimes passing for a white man. That was insane. And I think Ruby is passing in this episode in ways that make us deeply uncomfortable in ways that most of us would claim we never would do. Most, I think most Black people watching this episode are going to say to themselves, I would never. Couldn't be me. Couldn't be me taking a potion to turn into a white woman. But <laughs> I don't know if it couldn't be you. And I right. had that exact same reaction when we started breaking episode five. Couldn't be me. Couldn't be me. I'm black. I'm proud. My kids are black and proud. My mama was black and proud. And then it's like, but wait a minute. Don't we all, don't we all do different versions of passing? And mm. what do they look like? Don't we have something that we call code switching? Don't we? Haven't we? <laughs> I've certainly heard of it. I've heard of code switching. I, I know that that seems very different from what we're watching in the episode, especially when you're literally watching her flesh fall off of her body. Oh, my God. Every time, every time I was like, uh-uh, uh-uh. No, don't do it again. And then they would do it do again. Do it again. Every time they did it again. But the horror of that I don't know that that's completely different from changing your voice when you're on the phone or being in an office and wearing your hair a particular way because you don't want to deal with white people being like, oh, my God, your hair grew overnight. Like Oof. all of those things Oof. that we do to fit into an American society and we do it to save our lives. We do it to make money. We do it because our parents told us that there are certain things that we have to do. But I think all of that is a version of of passing. And I think if we can look at Ruby's story in that way, we can also talk about the horror of everything else that's happening. But I I think we're closer to her. I think a lot of us are closer to her than we think. Oh, that's always going to be true. People are always closer to the thing they say they'll never do. People do all kinds of things to survive. And you do things to survive as well. You are in survival mode. It doesn't help you to look down on other people, you know, which Ruby finds out, I think. Yes. In this experience, one of the things that I really liked watching Ruby do is be so honest with William about her feelings and about the fact that she don't trust this shit. Like, yeah, I understand that I have this shit and you got me doing this shit. And like, yeah, I'm not going to lie. It feels good. <laughs> but I'm not a dummy and I don't trust this shit. Right. Right. And the thing she tells him is the best thing about being white, and I love this, was not being interrupted. Mm. Oh, Shannon. Oof. And it's it's that thing that I feel like you, when we start to learn about the ways that the world will attempt to hold us back, when we start to learn about all the places where so far, we have not been allowed to go mm -hmm. or to reach because of our skin color, our gender, or non-gender, like whatever it is. So much of it is like just in our way. I have so many things I want to do in this life. Ugh. So many things I want to try. And I can't tell you how many times I've had to stop and think, okay, but does that make sense for me? And not like what I want but literally the way I look, the way I sound, the way I, all of those things, does it fit 
when I walk into that space because I don't really care. You know, like I would love to be able to show up as me, but will I be safe? It's a survival thing. Can I just be safe right. while I go on about my business? Can if I, I live? mind my business? Can I live? Can I live? If I mind my business, will you mind yours? No, and the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is no. And I think like when you were describing that feeling, I just thought of, you know, we have this myth in this country that black people have never had money or black people have never had wealth or black people, you know, we need to buy black owned things. There's a part of me that's like, okay, we can do that, but do y'all realize we have done this before? Like, right. <laughs> do y'all realize that we created whole towns that were where everything was black owned? And again, we created them out of necessity because we weren't allowed in certain places. But I'm like, we did this. We had places like Tulsa. There were Tulsa's the the example that everybody uses because it's Black Wall Street, but there were a million places where black people were doing just fine and they were interrupted. Somebody didn't like it and showed up and torched the place. If you look at the history of uh, Central Park in New York, I I hadn't known this. This was a village. It was a Mm -hmm. beautiful village of black people, black people minding their own business and then interrupted because white people wanted to build a park and they wanted to get rid of them. And so when Ruby says, I'm just tired of being interrupted, it's like, that's what the potion is for. We had this great discussion in the room. And I want to be clear. I think people... I know that I thought, before I was a TV writer, I thought, okay, that idea that I'm seeing on the screen was the first idea that they had. Or maybe it was the (laughs) second or third idea that they had. Um, There was so much work put into this episode. We broke out whole... We broke out a whole storyline and we were really excited about it at first because we were going to, like, you know, William gives her a stack of money next to the potion. And so mm-hmm. in the original idea, we thought she'll take the money, she'll go on a shopping spree, she'll go to the spa. Like, I, like we were just thinking of that um, pretty, like, almost like pretty woman feeling. And then mm-hmm. we really thought about it some more and we went, but is that the thing that you want? As a black woman, like, is that what Ruby want? Does she, is she looking for more money? Is she looking for a lavish life? Not necessarily, because Ruby's a hustler. She keeps multiple jobs. Right. She is the responsible sister. Um, she stands on her own two feet. There's this thing that she's been going after for a long time, which is the department store. But it's like, she kind of just wants, like, let me live my life. I just want to be kind of left alone, but I would like to do it in this department store, so I'm going to work my ass off to get there. And... What we decided was she doesn't take the money because she doesn't need the money. And I think she says that line, the only currency I needed (laughs) was this whiteness. And when she does that walk through the streets and goes into the ice cream store and for colored girls is playing over this journey, it's so haunting and sad because it's like she just can't believe she gets to walk through the streets and be left alone and that she can just sit on a bench and be left alone. Um, Like, that's the feeling that she's craving, and that's what she's going after. And then, of course, it starts to morph, right? She wants more than Mm -hmm. that. And then she wants more than that, because she also starts to see how complicated it is, and she's feeling tortured. Um, I think that that question that you asked, can I even do this? Am I allowed Mm -hmm. to have this? Or should I be doing something else? Like, all of those questions are kind of swirling in her head. And then that plays out in this, like, completely strange, uncomfortable relationship that she has with Tamara at the job. And it's really heartbreaking because we're watching her learn this world and navigate this world and be excited about this world at first. But then she starts to lean into cruelty partly because she's trying to prepare Tamara for the world around her. Um, These scenes are so icky. What do you think? I think it's partly because she's trying to prepare Tamara and partly because she can. Mm. When we talk about, you know, giving a person an amount of power that they don't necessarily respect and have never had access to before, um, and the seduction of that power to abuse it, And I think that's part of what we're seeing here in her relationship with Tamara. I mean, she's an assistant manager now, but she had to become white to do it. Right. And there is this 
just intense tension between them. And it's wild as a viewer because you're thinking like, how would I be seeing this as Tamara? Which is that it would be just another white woman on my ass. You know what I mean? Just another white woman right. messing with me. Right. Like that's the way I see it as Tamara. As Ruby, I see it as somebody doing a really misguided call-in of someone else. And then as a, like, like a person just thinking about the story altogether, I'm heartbroken because neither one of these women should be find, should have found themselves in this position. Mm. Neither one of these women would have to be dealing with this if the world would get on board. Yes. Neither of them would be here. And Tamara just suffers. You know, in that episode, she suffers. And Ruby is put in the position of victim, perpetrator, and rescuer. You know? Yes. Because part of why she does what she does at the end is because of what she sees him do to Tamara. I want to talk a little more about that stiletto Cardi B scene because I don't like to say what the show is, even though that's literally my job. But <laughs> part of the part of my resistance comes from like, no, the point is we sat in a writer's room and we made this up being guided by Matt Ruff's book. But it's not our job to tell you what every single thing means. And it's not our it's right. not even my job to tell you this is exactly what you're supposed to feel. That is the beauty of this episode and other episodes that are coming. We're not going to tell you if Ruby was right or wrong. We're not going to tell you how you should feel watching that scene. But I suspect you felt 12 different things. And one thing that the scene is definitely about is what Black women get to do with their rage and what they get to do with their anger. And we had this, we talked about it for so long in the room, this question of like, basically, should we do the scene, period? Because it's mm-hmm. in, an interesting idea. But um, somebody in the room said, well, that white man has to do a lot of bad things first before Ruby assaults him. We have to know that he's like the worst guy ever. And initially that sounded right. But as we talked about it and we talked about like, well, wait, how many rape scenes have we all watched on television where nobody did anything to quote unquote deserve Mm. it? Nobody was, (laughs) Sansa was minding her business. Um, Right. Several other women on that show were minding their business. And on many other shows, women minding their business and getting raped. Why do we have to, how much justification do we need for Ruby to do this? Um, And is there a problem with even asking that question? But then... Um, There's also the reality, which is like, this is violent, and it's a person with power doing a violent, horrifying thing. And I think think what we came to was, but like what we're saying with the other characters, of course she's doing a horrible, violent thing. We live in America. We don't really Mm. know how else to feel powerful. And we also all come from a history of watching and knowing how many white men have done this. So we didn't need to see, um, I think his name is Paul, the manager. We didn't need to see Paul actually rape Tamara. We didn't need to see that scene go any further than it did because the way that I look at it, Ruby is tired of being interrupted and she comes from a long line of Black women who have been interrupted. And when I say interrupted at this point, I'm literally talking about raped, meaning mm-hmm. like this this entire country. And I'm just going to rattle off names of like some women that we talked about in the room um, that are haunting around Ruby's head when she sees Paul and Tamara. She's not just looking at Paul and Tamara. She's looking at Reese Taylor, who was raped by six men, including a U.S. Army private. She's looking at Sally Hemings, who was raped by Thomas Jefferson, our third president. She's looking at Sojourner Truth, who was raped by her white mistress, Sally Dumont. The many, many Black women, I'm thinking about these women now, the many Black women who were raped by this awful human being, Daniel Holtzclaw, our mothers, our grandmothers, our Mm great-grandmothers. So that's 
what's happening in that scene, in my opinion, along with everything else that's happening, along with Ruby's own frustrations with her own life, she's also just like, I'm fucking tired of this. And also, I'm a little bit complicit, right? Right. In what's happening with Tamara right now. And she takes that rage and she does this crazy, monstrous, also thrilling thing. I think one of the things that this in this whole episode is really toying with or playing with is the question of what we do with our anger, period. And not just in terms of like what we do with it um, when we express it, but also how we metabolize it and what we've been taught to do with mm. it. So many of our emotional reactions are learned reactions. We mirror. We do what we've learned to do. And it's not necessarily, you know, in this moment anyway, it's not necessarily that like this is something I've been waiting to do forever. It's like I saw the opportunity and I took it for everybody who didn't have the opportunity. Now, is that right? That you have to decide that according to your own moral code, right? Yeah. But I don't know if the most important question is, is it right? I think the more important question is, where did it come from? And what do we do now that we know it's here? Yes. There was this moment in the room where Sonia and Jay, who wrote the episode with Misha, brought in all this research from the 1950s. And I'm going to share some of that in the references and recommendations. But it wasn't always a stiletto. We didn't know how it was going to happen. But they found out that the same exact year that our episode was going to be taken place, the stiletto had been invented. Mm. And the like excitement that I felt when they presented that information is also disturbing me right now, just in thinking about what you're saying, which is like, it's not a question of right or wrong. It's kind of a question of like, why do we feel this way? Why do we feel vindicated, but also disturbed, but also excited, but also like angry? Like, what are all those feelings about? And so I hope that um, everybody watching will really take some time to sit with all all the many feelings that this episode brought about and really like interrogate them. And we're going to leave you guys with some references and recommendations that might actually help you unpack some of those feelings. So first I wanted to share this. It's a YouTube video called The New Girl in the Office. It's an old film from the 60s and It's about how an office changes when the Black girl is hired. And we used this in the writer's room to craft a lot of the department store scenes. Mm. And um, it's a powerful, strange, disturbing film. And so I invite everybody to check that out. Fearing the Black Body by Sabrina Strings. All About Love, New Visions by Bell Hooks. Kimberly Crenshaw's 1989 essay, Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex, a Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine, Feminist Theory, and Anti-Racist Politics. Uh, What else do we have, Ashley? Frank Ocean's Bad Religion, (sighs) When Montrose Won't Kiss Sammy. Ooh, Uh, I was like, no, they didn't play this song. But we did. Um, And in the scene where Moses Sumney's Lonely World... Um, there's something about this current moment in music where a lot of the most popular musicians are black men singing about their queerness, uh. and I'm here for it. I'm into yes. it. Yes. The book Passing by Nella Larson, For Colored Girls Who Have Considered Suicide When the Rainbow Is Enough by Intezaki Shange, an article about Carol Walker by Zadie Smith, What Do We Want History to Do to Us, Watermelon Woman, a film by this episode's director, Cheryl Dunye. And I just wanted to include really quickly The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. Mm. Also Eloquent Rage by Dr. Brittany Cooper. Yes, yes. So much to dive into. I can't believe we're done with this episode because I'm not done with this episode and I'll never be done with this episode. But that is our show (laughs) for the week. Uh, Thank you so much for listening. This show is hosted by us. I'm Shannon Houston. And I'm Ashley C. Ford. This podcast was produced by HBO in conjunction with Pineapple Street Studios. Our executive producers are Jenna Weiss-Berman, Max Linsky, and Barry Finkel. Aganare Shashagre is our managing producer. This episode's lead producer is Jess Jupiter. And our associate producers are Alexis Moore and Natalie Brennan. Our editors are Maddie Sprung-Kaiser and Josh Gwynn. Noriko Akabe is our engineer. 
Original music by composer Amanda Jones. If you like the show and you have a minute, you can review and rate this podcast via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you might get your podcasts. It really helps people find the show. You can also stream the podcast on HBO and HBO Max. We'll be back next week for episode six, which premieres on HBO and streams on HBO Max on September 20th at 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Bye.